think I was almost standoffish to a fault because I wanted it to be known. I'm not in here to marry a baseball player. There have been other women in my shoes who have done that. Um, so I was almost like standoffish to a fault. And then once they get to know you, like then I was pregnant and had a kid. Like they like didn't want did it. They didn't want to hit on me. Like so it just became different. Like Emily Jones with the Rangers is a great example. She is like best friends with these guys. She's at their wedding. Uh, so the longer you're around them, it, it just becomes different. It's hard for the first year because I also feel like a lot of times people try and test you. Like, you know, like, hey, you know, is she going to stand up for herself? And so I think if you make a point early on, like this is not what I'm about, uh, then it doesn't really follow you. Is there anybody you wanted to interview that you haven't yet? Roger Federer. Um, my husband's uh, played tennis uh, at Tennessee and is a huge tennis fan. I'm a huge tennis fan. Uh, we dressed my son up as Roger Federer for Halloween last year. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, in there, when I was in college, my professor had a sign on the board and it said, "Sports reporters have the worst job because they're the rare people to get to meet their heroes and realize they're not all they're cracked up to be." Uh, which is true. You know, not everyone is as nice. And, you know, people have their bad moments. And I had to interview a lot of people at their bad moments. And so sometimes they're not always, especially if these people do interviews every single day, they're going to have some bad days. Um, but to me, Roger Federer has given more to the game, has been more philanthropic than anyone else. Um, and so him, um, him and Pat Summit were my other heroes. I, I got to cover Pat um, for several years. Um, and she is everything that you see in TV. So is Dabo Sweeney. Dabo Sweeney is everything that you yeah. see on person. If you don't know who Pat Summit is, please Google her. <laughs> please. You guys know who Dabo is. That's obvious. Yeah. Who's your favorite interview? Um, Dabo's pretty good. Uh, I'll give you kind of uh, a great answer. Uh, I'm trying to think of people maybe outside the box. You know, what you want is something not cliche. Uh, I mean, Dabo has his like BYOG stuff, and, and but they're his things. And it's actual, it's, it's real. I used to think like this is just a put on, but that's just actually how he is, uh, which is cool. Um, who else is good? Bruce Pearl, who I'm actually going to go do their game, basketball coach at Auburn. He, he'll always give you a good sound bite. Um, Pat Summit was amazing to interview because she would always tell you like it is. She had no problem throwing her players under the bus if they were terrible. They, until I got to, so I, I came to Knoxville in 2008. Before that, the Lady Ball basketball team had never, had advanced through the Sweet 16 or farther every year in their history. The year I get there, they lose in the first round. And here I'm like, I gotta go interview Pat Summit after the worst performance in the history of this school. And she was great. And she was like, my team quit. I hope they're crying for the next three days. Um, so if someone's honest with you, like I don't care how mean it is or whatever, um, all you really kind of want is some honesty and not cliches of, we'll get them next time or I gotta go watch the film or, you know. You knew what you wanted to do at an earlier age than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Did you set a plan for that? Did you follow it and, you know, explain your little process? Yeah, I did. I mean, I knew this is what I wanted to do since I was 12. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that I would do when I was younger is um, I would put on the co closed captioning on the newscast because it was kind of like a teleprompter and I would read it as it went along. Um, but I will say there's been several moments where then I got to it and I thought this is not what I want to do. So I went to Mizzou. My one beef with the University of Missouri is you don't get into the journalism school until your junior year. So if you end up not liking it, by that point, you know, it's your senior year, what are you gonna do? And like with a broadcast television degree, I mean, there's not that, that doesn't reach that many things besides PR. Um, after my junior, first uh, semester junior year, they said, here's a camera and here's some editing equipment. And I was like, what? Like, I just thought I had to talk with a microphone. And they were like, uh, no, you have to shoot all your own stuff, you have to edit all your own stuff, 
I was like, this is, and I was not a tech person. I was like, this is not what I signed up for. So my soft, or my second semester, my junior year, I did a study abroad program. Mizzou has internships uh, in London. And I was like, I'm not doing TV, I'm gonna do magazine. And so I did an internship in magazine and was planning on, Mizzou has an entire magazine major. And I was like, I'm gonna switch to magazine. Um, I was also used to like being a, a really smart kid. Like I was in the honors college and like the first couple we call them packages that I did at Mizzou, like I got C's on. And there's people, and they're criticizing my work and my appearance on TV and I'm crying and like, I, my parents were like, you don't have the heart like to take all this criticism. And so I almost quit a couple times in college. Um, I almost quit when it took me six months to get my first job. Um, I graduated in May. I didn't get my job until November. Um, sent VHS all over the place. Turned down in Lawton, Oklahoma. Um, turned down a lot of places. Um, I think part of it is the, the, the one fault is if you're applying to somewhere in local news, there's really only two to three people in, in a department. And if one of them's already a, a female there, it's hard to have two females in a sports department because people, you know, want a little bit of diversity. Um, and so I ran into that a little. Um, I, I got turned down from one job because they said you gotta drive an hour and a half away at night and we don't feel comfortable you being by yourself on a Friday night in the middle of nowhere, taking a camera driving from a high school football game. Um, I will say like, if you wanna do what I do now, there are so many different avenues to take now. Um, in fact, very few come from like the no local news route like I did. That used to be the way you got into TV then. Now, schools have their own uh, like YouTube channels, um, especially within the SEC. So when the SEC Network uh, and ESPN came into agreement, they required all the SEC schools to have their own television stations or s studios. So they do their own student broadcasts there that are paid. Um, there's grad students that do it there. Um, and then those people will then can do sideline and play-by-play -play for our, um, what we call ESPN free games. So if, if a game is not big enough to be on TV, it'll be on e just online. And they'll use students uh, and grad students to do the play-by-play -play and the telecast. They'll use students to do the camera work. Um, the producer and director is a big job, so that's usually an ESPN staff employee. But um, and when the ACC network comes into existence, that's going to be the same thing. Um, there's a lot of different avenues. I know uh, Texas A&M has 12-man productions, which is basically the same thing. Um, there's a lot of different ways to kind of get into the business if that's what you're looking for. My job is just on air. There's a ton of, like, being a producer, the guy that sits in the truck and basically what we say, like, puts the whole story of a game on air. It could be the director, which we call, which we say cuts, cuts all the shots, um, takes the different camera angles, takes the replays. Uh, it involves a completely different mindset than what I have. Um, we have editors, graphics, stats people. If you're a big stats person, every play-by-play -play has a stats person with them in every game, giving them, like if you ever, there was an old show called Stump the Schwab where it's like this guy that knows like history, like ridiculous stats from like 1923. But if that's kind of your brain and how it works, like that's a fascinating job. Um, there's just a, a ton of different jobs within just TV and not just on air. It's something that you're interested in. Are there any classes you think they should take as they prepare for their college career and then their after college careers that would help them, like, you know, communications, writing, speaking, you know, that would benefit them no matter what they do? Yeah, any kind of um, speaking. I wish I did more public speaking. Like, I would say I'm not very good at it. I get really nervous public speaking. I don't know why I can talk in front of a camera for hours because no one else is there but me and the cameraman. Uh, public speaking helps a lot. Uh, writing as well, because you'll have to write all your own scripts. I will say writing for TV, very different from writing for newspaper and magazine. Um, it's very conversational. Um, there's a, a certain method to writing in newspaper that 
they call the inverted pyramid. Like it, there's just, in school you'll learn different ways of writing. Um, I think that getting hands-on experience, just shadowing someone at a TV station to say, is this what I wanna do? Um, or whatever field you're interested in, because if you find out earlier that it's not what you wanna do, at least you can cross that off the list. Uh, my sister is seven years younger than me. She had no idea what she wanted to do. She still doesn't, but uh, you know, you just kind of figure it out as you go along, but she figured out what she didn't want to do. She went, she, she lives in Austin and worked for the government for two years and said, I don't want to do that. Um, so I think just shadowing people, and again, don't be afraid to be a little bit, no, you know, not nosy, but like, uh, what, what do they say, the squeaky mouse gets the cheese or wheel, whatever it is. Like, if, you, if you're persistent, people like persistence. Um, I say all the time, oh, please email me, and then I get, like, completely forget to write that person back. So I always say, if I don't answer, please email me again, because sometimes it'll be at the bottom, you know, of an email, and you'll forget, forget to get back to it. So um, if you're interested in something, just email and say, hey, I'd like to shadow you for a day. You know, people aren't going to say no. If people like what they do, they'll want to share that with someone else. What's college game day like? Game day the show or a game for Yeah, me? like that. Uh, that's an intense. It's a day. He thought it was the other day. Oh. We're on a block schedule. He thought it was B day. Gotcha. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, college game day is an intense production. Like I have for my. For my games, we have 11 cameras. They have, I think, uh, like 25. And that's just for a show. Like, there's not even football being played. Um, I will say, if you're at all interested, um, there's a lot of really cool podcasts. Richard Deitch, who uh, is a uh, <coughs> works for Sports Illustrated, he covers sports media. He will do a podcast, and he's done a little bit of everything. He'll take the uh, Sunday night football director and just say, Sh tell me about your process. What's your week like? Um, and so there's some fascinating things that I've learned from other people on that podcast. Uh, Jim Miller has a podcast called Origins. He did one on Curb Your Enthusiasm. It takes you, it's, it's basically an oral history and uh, he just did one on ESPN, and there's different episodes. One's on how did PTI get started, how did 30 for 30 get started, and there's one on college game day. Um, and it's fascinating just where it started, and they'll talk about some of the biggest hiccups that have ever happened. Um, three hours of live, non-scripted television uh, is a beast, and the, the guy that produces it is, is awesome. Um, so yeah, I would say listen to those. They're pretty interesting. How do you think the new FBI thing that came in will affect college sports? Oof. Um, He's a I, basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it's big. I think there'll be a lot of coaches that don't have jobs at the end of the year. Please year. stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag <laughs> of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for the Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, Wolverine. Yeah. So I think the, the FBI thing will be uh, really interesting. I think a lot of people will lose their jobs. Tomorrow we will wear our own to show support for the students of the Florida. If you would like to participate, because to me it's the main gym during an advisory tomorrow where you're going to say, for a photo. Oh, this the picture will be made into a banner and send to someone who's going to high school to show that Wayland is thinking about them and is Douglas Strong. It's not that easy. Because while basketball and football bring in money and uh, their images are sold, the countless swimmers and divers, the tennis players, uh, you know, my husband was a tennis player at Tennessee. He didn't get a full ride because for tennis players on an eight-man tennis team, there's only four and a half scholarships. 
So until he was 30 years old, he was still play, paying off college. Um, with Title IX, if you're going to pay a basketball player, you're going to have to pay a lacrosse player. Um, so how does that work? So I think it's almost separate from the NCAA. I think, to me, a perfect scenario for me is allow these guys to, to, to have agents. I had no idea until the other day that in college hockey you can have agents. I have no idea why it's different sport to sport, but it's the only sport in college you can have an agent, and it'd still be okay. Um, I think if you know if you if, if the NCAA says we're going to pay everyone, you're, all this stuff from the agents is still going to be happening. So I don't see why that stops it. But if, you, if people want to go ahead and get a shoe deal while they're you know a freshman, that doesn't bother me. Because I don't think it's going to be as widespread as people think. You know, people are like, oh, that you know, this is going to mess up college football. If college football is not as rampant because people aren't sure things when they're 18. People are sure things in basketball right away. College, they're not. So I don't think as many agents will be spending millions of dollars going after 18-year-olds that could, you know, tear their ACL uh, and never play again. So I don't know. I think it'll be interesting. It's crazy to me how close we are to the tournament and all these players that are being held out and uh, like the some that are, are still playing and how that affects things. Um, like if Aiden gets caught, you know, what happens to Arizona? What if they continue to play and then he ends up being ineligible? I guess it's you already played him this far, so, um, but I think it'll be really interesting. Do you think like Coach K and like Cal Perry might end up on the way out this year now? Uh, to the NBA, you mean? Or I mean, yeah, well, I mean, they have anywhere but college basketball. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, because here's the deal. I don't think, you know, we, I was actually having this conversation with my husband today. That, uh, he's like, oh, they're going to cover it up, and, you know, they're going to let all the, the blue blood slide because they're not going to want to ruin college basketball. I'm like, the FBI doesn't care. And also my beef with the NCAA is you didn't care at North Carolina that they were faking classes, but now you want to care that a guy's getting, you know, a couple dinners, you know, out of something. So I don't think that, I think more of it becomes the criminality of it than, um, that I, don't, I really don't think nothing's going to happen with the NCAA unless people are deemed ineligible. Um, but there has to be a lot of proof. Like, the whole thing with um, Arizona is that they might have them on wiretap, like saying, you know, I gave, you know, give them a hundred thousand dollars. But unless you can prove that the money was actually exchanged hands, th then nothing happened. So I don't know if any of it will be resolved by the tournament. I do think that like more bombshells will come out before then. What do you think? Do you think players players should be paid? Um, I think they should be able to get money off their own like this. Yeah. Um, like they can sell autographs and stuff like that. But yeah. yeah, you would have to find a way to do it by like proportion of how much money their sport makes and the total revenue of the whole athletic yeah. department. I think what becomes interesting is then how does the IRS get involved? Because if someone made a hundred thousand dollars, well then the IRS, if that's a gift, probably earns probably forty five percent of that. So then that becomes my other thing. Like, I can't do my own taxes right now. You're going to tell me an 18 year old's going to get paid from the university and they're going to know how to do their taxes? Like, so there's just a lot that goes into it. Her parents still claim them as an exemption, so. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, the, I, don't, I don't want, if every player gets paid by the school, these, a lot of these schools are actually working in the red. Like, they're not making that big of a profit. So in order to afford that, they'll have to cut the non-revenue sports. And things like swimming, diving, golf, tennis won't exist anymore. And then there'll be a bigger gap between the big schools and the smaller schools. Because a Wichita State won't be able to afford what an Alabama will. And there'll just be a bigger gap. And, and I don't like that, because I like good Cinderella stories, you know? Is there an event you haven't worked that you want to work? Uh, Wimbledon. Okay. Uh, what else? This sounds totally lame, but I would love to do Little League World Series because it looks like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's always still like, you know, you want to be on a better crew and you want to be on a better time slot and you want to do better games, you know. Yeah, I'd love to do the Super Bowl, the National Championship, you know, but also people are like, oh, you're doing March Madness. Well, ESPN doesn't have March Madness. So if I ever wanted to do that, then I gotta go to CBS. 
you know, ESPN said we're going to have a Super Bowl. 